This is a graph of how much power Formula One engines have produced from the very first championship race in 1950 all the way up to today. And the build-up has been far from steady with massive breakthroughs and tight restrictions. So let me take you through it, explain why these changes have happened as well as the engineering behind it. But before we run through this, I better explain how we got to this graph because it's been tricky. As you know, F1 teams very rarely share horsepower figures for their engines, and this is for good reason. For example, Mercedes wouldn't want Honda knowing how much power or torque the engines produce, as it may expose secrets about how the engines are tuned or designed. It could also allow them to match the performance figures and then elect to work on things like reliability or efficiency or something else like that. So they kept secret. Well, except for when they boast about things. For example, Renault back in 2014 announced that their engine had over a thousand horsepower and that was a big deal. And if you can remember, they were far from the front of the pack at this point. And whilst the rest of the grid stated their suspicion about the accuracy of these numbers, it did work as a PR booster. And after all, that's why the manufacturers are in Formula One in the first place. Another way is from testing historical cars. For example, many cars are sold off after they've retired from Formula One. Scott has driven several of these that are in private ownership because of this. So if you can put one on a dyno, it's relatively easy to get a good idea of how much power they're producing. <laughs> And so this is how we've collated this data, from scouring the internet for credible sources that publish these numbers and then cross-checking them against each other. Now, this is far from perfect. The data can sometimes be exaggerated by the manufacturers, come from inaccurate testing, or published based on rough guesses from engineers. And there are other things too. For example, in 1983, the teams produced well over 1,200 horsepower, but this is because they could destroy the engine in one lap. Whereas now the teams only have three engines to use over the entire season. So this will affect the amount of peak horsepower they can produce whilst also making reliable engines. There are also other things like varying fuel limits, different fuels altogether, as well as a host of other factors. But despite this, it's still fascinating to see how the power has varied over each year in Formula One. So here it is, the most powerful engine from each year plotted to show us the incredible evolution of Formula One engines. But this doesn't make any sense without some context. So let's start with the 50s. The first few years of Formula One were kind of all over the place. There were very few races compared to today. The cars were very simple and they actually had a hard time fielding a full grid. The cars were allowed a maximum displacement of 4.5 litres if they were naturally aspirated or 1.5 litres if they used any kind of supercharger or turbo. And the majority of the teams elected to use the supercharged option as it allowed for comparable power, but a fraction of the weight, something they understood from aerospace engines in the war. And so we start this graph at 425 horsepower, but you'll notice it drops off pretty much immediately. The half full grids were becoming an issue, so Formula One elected to switch to Formula Two regulations. And whilst the formulas were closer in performance then than they are now, this dramatically reduced the horsepower down to 175. And this was because turbos were banned and get used to that happening in this video. And the cars had to use two liter naturally aspirated units, and they mainly elected for inline fours. But this was far from the only configuration as engineers were pretty experimental in the 50s, trialing any engine they could think of. Things like inline fours, eights, V12s, V8s, and even a massive V-twin. In 1954, the regulations mandated either 2.5 liters or a tiny 750 cc engine if they elected to use a supercharger. However, unsurprisingly, nobody chose those tiny engines. For the rest of the 50s, the team settled on either inline fours or sixes and then worked on improving efficiency. They were able to raise the red line, improving fuel efficiency and even trialing new technology. In 1955, Mercedes introduced the first engine to use direct injection, a system that's still used today. Power steadily increased up until 1960, where the regulators started a trend, restricting power to keep speeds under control. And yes, you can moan about the FIA restricting speed, but remember that these cars were doing 180 miles an hour on the straights with hay bales for safety barriers and literally zero crash protection. But just as we've seen time and time again in Formula One, the team soon find a way to improve performance. In 1966, Formula One decided to increase power by moving to 3.5 litre engines. And this was a welcome horsepower boost as GT cars were actually faster than Formula One cars for a few years. And this was a time of relative stability in engine regulations with only a limit on displacement. So the teams all tried different things. I've got two favorites. There was the BRM H16, essentially two V8s smashed together, and the Lotus 56B, which actually made use of a Pratt & Whitney 
gas turbine engine from a helicopter. The H16 was immensely complicated and drank nearly as much oil as it did fuel, so it was never competitive. But the Lotus with its helicopter engine was actually close to winning in 1967, but was banned soon after that. You can then see over the next 10 years, the power increased at a steady rate up until this, the turbo era which actually started back in 1977 with Renault's RS01. And this was due to one rule I didn't mention earlier. When the three litre engines came in, there was also an option for a 1.5 litre turbocharged option. It's just that nobody elected to use it, well, until Renault did. They were the first to really try and capitalize on the additional horsepower that a V6 turbo engine could provide only they couldn't do it whilst also making the engine reliable. So really it was a test bed for what was to come. They introduced electronic ignition as well as water injection. And this was to prevent the hot spots that were forming in the engine due to the incredible heat and power they produced. But this development was slowly working. It started in 1977 with 500 horsepower and in 1983, it had over 700 horsepower. And this was the proof that was needed for many of the other teams to follow suit while the ones that could have afford it. Now I'm sure you've been wondering what this massive spike is. That's when F1 horsepower went mental. In the 80s, the team's ability to crank up the power actually outweighed their ability to put it down on the road, making the cars near undrivable. Boost pressures went skyward and so the teams had to make engines stronger with new alloys and different cooling systems. However, they only managed up to a point. And this led to the era of qualifying engines, or grenades as they were actually called. Engines with the boost turned up so high that they only lasted a single push lap before they were done. And the teams would then just fit a new engine and turn down the boost for the race. However, they still produced over 850 horsepower in race trim. And in 1986, we get this, the BMW M12, the most powerful Formula One engine ever. Now we actually don't know exactly how much power it produced as there weren't any dynos that could measure much above a thousand horsepower at the time. However, it was calculated to be just over 1400. Absolutely insane. However, this didn't last long as insane power coupled with the incredible downforce from ground effect led to a lot of spectacular crashes. So the FIA imposed a limit of four bars of boost pressure in 1987 and then 2.5 bars in 1988 before banning turbos altogether in 1989. So the engines then moved back to a 3.5 litre naturally aspirated formula. But from the turbo era came a better understanding of material strength and technology that is needed to produce a strong engine. So the power soon increased again. There were innovations like Honda introducing titanium alloy valves that were far stronger, and Renault introducing a pneumatic valve system. This allowed for far higher revving engines as the valves could be actuated faster and more accurately than they could with a traditional cam system. And this is something that can still be seen in today's cars. In 1995, the engines were brought down to three liter units from 3.5. However, as we've seen before, this doesn't stop them from soon regaining the power. This time around, more advanced computer design, manufacturing and simulation tools enabled engines that could be manufactured to rev much higher whilst also still being reliable. During this time, the main regulation on the engines was that they couldn't use more than 12 cylinders. Ferrari stuck by this using a V12, but Honda and Renault moved towards a more reliable V10 formation. Towards the year 2000, all of the teams had landed on the V10 before the FIA mandated it up until 2006. And this was a time of incredible power with 950 horsepower and cars that only weighed 600 kilos. But look here, in 2006, there was a massive drop in power from 950 down to 750. And this was down to a new maximum rev limit of 19,000 revs, a decreased 2.4 liter capacity and a move to V8. And you can see here that the power stayed pretty constant up until the addition of Kurs in 2009. And you can see here, this gave the cars an extra 80 horsepower on top of the 750 from the V8, but only for very short bursts. But this was really just a taste for what was to come in 2014, a move to the turbo hybrid powertrain. This comprised of a 1.6 litre V6 engine with a single turbocharger and a 120 kilowatt motor. And this was the move that allowed the cars to produce similar power to the Kurs engines whilst using a third less fuel. And since 2014, the engines have continued to produce more and more power whilst lasting longer, being more reliable and being more efficient. What's interesting though, is that the engines are still very constrained. They have to be a 90 degree V6 with a limit of 15,000 RPM there are set sizes of battery store as well as the stroke length and piston size. 
However, despite this, there's been some incredible innovations. In 2014, Mercedes came up with the idea of splitting the turbocharger to keep the inlet air cooler and produce more power. This enabled them to create the first engine with an astonishing 50% thermal efficiency, something that has never been done in F1. Honda has innovated with new coatings and alloys to allow them to shrink down the size of the engine, as well as Ferrari coming up with a totally legit way to produce more power than everyone else in 2019. If you want to find out what all this power Power did to lap times, you should watch this video where I show you just how the speed of Formula One cars has varied over the past 70 years. Don't forget that we're hiring a writer for our automotive channel, Driven Media. You can check that out with the link below. In case you're wondering who I am, I'm Callum. I'm a mechanical engineer, but I've been working here as a producer at Driver61 for 18 months. You may have heard my voice in a few of these videos, but this is the first one we've shot properly like this. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching and we'll catch you in the next one.